Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. Please visit our website, cscatlanta.org, for a complete list of live and recorded events. If this is your first time participating, we invite you to complete a new attendee form to stay connected to all future programs. Welcome everyone to today's nutrition program, How to Eat for Heart Health with Kristen Kukulowski with Northside Hospital Cancer Institute. I do wanna remind everyone that recordings of these programs along with um, our cooking demonstrations are all available on our website and that's cscatlanta.org. So if you ever miss a month's nutrition seminar, please visit our website so you can watch the recording. So Kristen, I will go ahead and pass it off to you. Sounds good. Thank you, Katie. Um, Hi, everybody. Happy Mardi Gras and happy National Heart Month. Um, So for this month's topic, I did choose um, how to eat for heart health because it is the American Heart Month, um, February, all month long, celebrating heart healthy um, habits and just raising awareness for general heart health. Um, So it's a little bit off of our oncology topic, but a lot of the things that um, are great for your heart are also just great for your overall health. So they go hand in hand. I do like to give a reminder, this is geared more for um, maybe more towards like survivorship patients that aren't actively going through treatment. If you are here and you're actively going through treatment, um, we do have dietitians throughout the North side system at Georgia Cancer Specialists, Atlanta Cancer Care, Northeast Georgia, diagnostic clinics, um, radiation, infusion, we're all over the place. So if you need more one-on-one care, um, you are welcome to reach out to your doctor or your clinic there to get that personalized nutrition. Uh, This is more, you know, group setting education and more um, geared towards your survivorship journey. We will get started here. Our objectives for today are to determine some of the risk factors for heart disease, identifying parts of a balanced heart healthy diet um, that you can implement and then making goals to improve your overall health. So just some food for thought, did you know that our heart does more physical work than any other muscle in the body? So it's obviously always pumping. The average heart pumps 2,000 gallons of blood per day or about 70 gallons per hour. So it's definitely moving all day, every day. Um, In a 70 year lifetime, an average human heart beats more than 2.5 billion times. So obviously our heart does a lot of work for us, which is vital that we take care of it to help keep us in tip top shape. And heart disease is the number one cause of death in the US for both men and women. That's why there's always so much focus around heart health. Um, But outside of just gender, it's also the number one cause of death for people of most racial and ethnic groups too. So it really affects all of us um, around the globe. And when we think about heart disease, we think about um, mostly heart attacks, which is a decreased blood flow to the heart area, um, and then also stroke. So sometimes people don't correlate stroke, um, strokes being part of your heart health, but it definitely can be. So there's a couple images here on the slide, and one of them has an artery that's around the heart that's blocked. Um, So it's blocking the blood flow. And then the same thing can actually happen in your brain as well that leads to stroke. So our arteries can build up plaque and different stuff um, that causes these blockages and decreases the blood flow to the brain or to the heart. And that is where um, the issues come in. So the CDC estimates that approximately 655,000 people die from heart disease annually. um, And that's about one in four deaths. And um, in the US, someone has a heart attack about every 40 seconds. So We definitely want to keep an eye on that and be as heart healthy as we can. But the good news is that risk factors, approximately 80% or more of heart disease can be prevented. Um, So there are some non-modifiable risk factors, but there's definitely a lot of modifiable risk factors. There are um, non-modifiable things you can't change. You can't change how old you are, um, your gender, your race, your ethnicity. So the non-preventable, like, since we can't change men that are greater than 45 years of age and women that are 55 years and older are at greater risk. Men tend to have a greater risk than women. African-Americans and Hispanics are at higher risk for developing heart disease. 
and then family history also plays um, a huge factor in risk for heart disease. So always know what your parents, your grandparents' medical history is. Um, if you have heart disease, share that with your kids um, so they know what they're, how they're kind of standing and what to keep an eye out for. The modifiable risk factors, so things that we can actually change on our own um, and that we have control over is smoking. So um, smoking increases your risk for heart disease. So stop smoking and you are decreasing your risk for heart disease. Alcohol intake increases your risk um, for heart disease, especially overconsumption. A poor diet, choosing um, low quality foods can increase your risk. Weight, and chronic diseases. So having diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, those are all things that we can change. Obviously, if you've already been diagnosed with some of these diseases, you can't necessarily change those, but you can definitely manage them through diet and exercise and um, medications to help prevent heart from forming. All right, so hypertension. Hypertension is high blood pressure. Um, same thing, different name. What affects our blood pressure? High sodium diets can affect your blood pressure. Stress and anxiety can also affect your blood pressure. Caffeine intake and your water intake. So high blood pressure can lead to stroke, heart attack, kidney failure, and congestive heart failure. So, um, you know, you may not be having all of these things contributing to blood pressure, but if you're very stressed and very anxious and you notice that your blood pressure does increase during those times, or um, if you drink a lot of caffeine and you kind of feel like your heart's racing or your pulse is really high, you know, those kind of things may be affecting how your blood pressure is actually um, pumping there. So ideally, we want our blood pressure to be less than 120 over 80. And then there, you've got a chart over here on the right, my right hand side, um, that has the different categories for like pre-hypertension, high blood pressure stage one, um, high blood pressure stage two. So you definitely want to check your blood pressure regularly, either at home or your doctor's office. You know, your doctor probably has told you how to do this um, or how often they recommend that you do it. And if they haven't, then that is a conversation that you can have directly with them. But knowing your numbers is important. So that way, you know, you know what to look out for and what you need to work on. High cholesterol is also um, part of heart disease. So cholesterol can be affected by our genetics. So it, again, may run in the family. Our diets affect cholesterol levels um, in our blood. So saturated fat intake, trans fat intake, and carbohydrate intake. We're going to talk more about these throughout the presentation about, you know, what to kind of, how much you should be eating and what you need to be staying away from that kind of stuff. Um, so don't get ahead of ourselves here, but high cholesterol can lead to um, blockages causing those heart attacks and strokes. So there's a couple different kinds of cholesterol um, or if you get like a lipid panel done at your physician practice. So you typically will get a total cholesterol, which is over on the far right hand side. And so this is the total amount of cholesterol that's in your body at the time that they draw your blood. So the desirable number, if you get your lab work back, is to be less than 200. And then we're going to skip over the triglycerides. The HDL and the LDL are also two numbers that you'll see under your total cholesterol, typically. And your HDL is what they call your good cholesterol. So 60 or higher on your lab work is ideal. Um, but you could also be around like 40 to 59, and that's okay. If you're less than 40, then you're increasing your risk for heart disease. And then LDL is our bad cholesterol. So um, we want to try to have that number less than 100 on the lab work. And your triglycerides are also usually included in this panel if you have your labs done. So this is also impacted by carbohydrate intake. And so the higher your carbohydrate intake, the greater your fat storage in the body can be. Um, so back in the day, people used to be like, you know, if you eat a lot of fat, then you have a lot of triglycerides floating around in your blood. But we know now that that's not necessarily true. Um, a lot of refined carbohydrates can also increase our triglyceride numbers. And so the optimal number here is 149 or less. So, how do we know like what we want to be 
checking out here. So the nutrition facts label is super helpful. And again, we're gonna go through each of these categories that we're highlighting here, but I wanted to just show the facts label. This is the newer version that launched a couple years ago. Companies still have a little bit of time to update to this new nutrition facts label. So you still might see the old one, but for the most part, most of our common products that I've seen at the grocery store have already transitioned over to this new label here. So when you're looking at the food label, one of the most important things is to look at the, the, what the serving size is for that food. So a facts label doesn't mean, you know, if you buy a big bag of chips, it's going to have a serving size and then how many servings of chips are in the bag you want to make sure. So I'm not exactly sure what this example is for here, but whatever it is, the serving size is going to be two thirds of a cup and the package has eight servings in there. So the amount, you know, where it says calories 230, that's the amount for one serving, not what's in the entire bag. So those are things to be mindful of because sometimes they can get tricky, especially if it looks like it's an individual package or an individual serving size. A good example of this could be like a regular soda that's in like a 20 ounce bottle. Sometimes they will put the serving size of eight ounces, but it actually contains two and a half servings. So um, I've seen now where they kind of split the label and they have how much is in a serving and then how much is also if you drink the whole bottle. So that's really nice to be able to see what you're actually getting yourself into without having to do all that math. Um, but you always want to start with the serving size. That way you know where you're at. And then you want to see how much saturated fat is in a food. So over on the left here, saturated fat, less than two grams per serving is considered a low saturated fat food item. Um, so that's a good gauge for um, helping to choose foods that are lower in saturated fat. And and a good example could be like whole milk versus skim milk. Um, the protein is usually the same in those foods. The carbohydrates are usually the same in the food, but it's the milk fat that they take out from whole milk to make skim milk. And that's where you're gonna see a big change in the total fat and then also the saturated fat there. The next one below there, they have to list the trans fat now. We always want this number to be zero. Just because it says zero doesn't always mean that it's trans fat free. This can be a little bit confusing, um, but if you have something in the ingredient list that has um, partially hydrogenated oils, then it may contain a little bit of trans fat. So as long as it's less than 0 0.5, like if it's 0 0.4 grams, they don't have to put it on the food label. They can put it at a zero. So you want to always double check the ingredient list that's also typically listed here and make sure that there's not something that's partially hydrogenated in there um, if you can. And then sodium is on there. So we try to shoot for no more than um, 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day. Most Americans get far more than that. So we're really looking for some of the lower sodium foods in our packaged foods and 140 milligrams or less per serving is considered that low sodium food. You're not gonna be able to find that every single time, but you just wanna be mindful. And if you can find stuff that has the less than 140, that's what you should try to choose if you're watching your sodium. You can see this example has 160 milligrams, so it's not going to be considered a low sodium food there. And then the other important thing are those added sugars. So the added sugars are what contribute to the higher triglyceride levels. Um, and then we also talk a lot about added sugars in cancer as well. So um, on the food label now, the products actually have to have um, added sugars listed. So You've got your total carbohydrates, you've got how much fiber is in there, how much sugar is in there. And then, you know, a lot of foods have just naturally occurring sugars, but then there's also added sugars. So a good example of this is our, some of our yogurts. So a regular yogurt tends to have just naturally occurring sugar from the lactose that it's made out of. But if you get a lot of these flavored yogurts, they may have a lot of added sugar from where they've added that flavoring in um, or added some of the fruits in. You know, I don't always know that they're whole fruits, but they're adding that flavoring in to help, um, you know, reach whatever flavor they're trying to promote. 
So just keeping a, a watchful eye on those added sugars. And there are a lot of foods that you don't even think have sugar in them um, that they've added just to help with preserving it. So for women, you should try to consume less than 25 grams per day of added sugar. And for men, they can do less than 37 grams per day of added sugar. So let's jump into breaking some of these down and what they are. So for our saturated and trans fat, Saturated fat is found in animal foods and it's solid at room temperature. So you can think about butter, butter is solid at room temperature. You can think about maybe the last time you made like hamburger meat or maybe bacon in a pan and the oil was liquidy when you were cooking it, but when you let the pan cool and there was white around it, that's the saturated fat that was left over from those oils. Um, so that is, you know, saturated fat that can build up in our arteries. And some examples of saturated fat are butter, coconut oil, palm oil, lard, more of your like 80-20 ground beef skin on the chicken breast. So the skin is gonna be um, fat and it's solid at room temperature. Bacon, sausage, whole milk, and then full fat cheeses. And then as far as trans fat goes, it's a chemistry change that occurs to create trans fat. Um, they use it a lot for preserving things, making things taste better. There's been huge pushes in the last several years um, to make things trans fat free and to really help improve the quality of those foods. So you're starting to see less and less trans fat in foods, but they can still you know, sneak stuff in there. So it's very detrimental to our heart health. There's really not like a safe recommended amount for us to consume. So avoiding it the best that we can is the best defense that we have. So examples are our hydrogenated oils. So those are typically found in baked goods and items that have like a really long shelf life or fried foods. So um, being mindful of that, an example could be your stick margarine um, is a, goes, undergoes a hydrogenation process to um, make the hydrogen atoms from a liquid vegetable oil stable to make it solid at room temperature. Um, so that's just an example of that. A lot of our baked goods and um, shortening, um, they use a lot of margarines while they're making them. Um, they also add a lot of preservatives to help make stuff um, shelf stable. And then back jumping over to the saturated fat, I wanted to touch on coconut oil a little bit because that's always a very popular topic. Um, so there have been some newer claims coming out in the last few years about coconut oil and as it relates to heart disease. Um, and those really aren't supported by any kind of science. Most saturated, um, coconut oil is mostly made up of saturated fat and it's actually made up of, of about 90% saturated fat versus like the 60% saturated fat that you would find in butter. So the claims from the newer research show that coconut oil can raise our HDL or our good cholesterol, but it also shows that it raises our LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol at this time. So we really don't know what the net benefit might be or the net harm. So just because it's raising the HDL, it's also raising your bad cholesterol. So it's probably raising your total cholesterol too. Um, so we just don't have that kind of research yet to show, you know, if it's beneficial or harmful. So if it's not something that you need to have in your diet or that you prefer, maybe avoiding that for now until we do get to have more information and more research on that. All right, so sodium. Sodium is a huge thing here, especially uh, because we do have such good shelf stable foods. Um, so sodium, it's used in food preservation, flavoring, and as a leavening agent. So um, we do typically have quite a bit found throughout our diets. It is naturally occurring. You'll find sodium and stuff like chicken, you know, it's not that anybody added it in there, it's just naturally occurring. But a diet that's high in sodium can lead to increased or um, high blood pressure. The American Heart Association recommends people consume between 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams of total sodium per day. And the average American consumes about 4,000 milligrams, so at least double what they currently recommend. And it's very easy, it adds up very quickly. Um, but a teaspoon of salt, and that's just a teaspoon, not a tablespoon, is equal to 2,300 milligrams. 
So that's an entire day's worth, a little bit more, um, if you're following the American Heart Association guidelines. So we just want to be very cautious in foods that we um, are getting. And then also when we're salting our food while we're cooking it, um, being mindful, because a lot of people put you know, a lot of salt into their water or into baked goods, you know, salt goes into all kinds of stuff. So just being mindful of how much sodium you're getting per day is very important here. But if you are looking at packaged foods, trying to find those foods that are less than 140 milligrams sodium per serving is um, your best bet. And then if you have some people in your household who just love to salt things like at the table, whether they taste it or not, you may consider, you know, not cooking with the salt and letting them add it themselves. That way they're in control and they're not getting double the salt amount since they're not even, I've seen people not even taste their food and they go ahead and shake salt all over it. So they're not sure exactly how much sodium is already in it. All right, added sugar. So added sugar, sugar that has been added to food for sweetness or even preserving um, different kinds of things, but this can lead to elevated triglycerides. So added sugars are not directly impacting our hearts, but they can lead to those elevated triglycerides, which we can um, see those elevated risk for heart disease. Um, so that is something to keep in mind reading food labels and ingredient labels to identify sources of added sugars. So now that the new food label has that breakdown of that very specific added sugar line, that's really gonna help a lot of people. But you can also check the ingredient list and look for words like sugar, glucose, high fructose corn syrup, honey, agave nectar, fructose, um, corn syrup, again, brown sugar, um, maltose, dextrose, rice syrup, et cetera. So any of those syrupy type names are going to be added sugars. And examples that you're gonna find added sugars in are yogurt, desserts, sweets, um, sugar sweetened beverages like your regular sodas, fruit juices, even if they're 100% natural, um, they typically will have some added sugars, but if not, um, you know, check the food label. Chocolate milk, because you're adding the chocolate powder into the milk, it's going to be an added sugar. Coffee drinks, when you're adding extra sugar packets or different flavorings there. Tea, um, your crackers, cereals, dried fruits, condiments. Sometimes things are savory and salty and they still have added sugars in there to help with the um, preserving. So keeping an eye on that because we want to make sure we're controlling our triglyceride levels and making sure that we're not causing any kind of blockages in our veins from having those elevated levels there. And then cholesterol, always a hot topic, um, always new stuff coming out about cholesterol. So some cholesterol is necessary as it is used in our body to make a lot of different substances. And it also makes up part of our cell membranes and it helps with vitamin D. We all know how important vitamin D is now. It's a super hot topic of this year and last year. Um, cholesterol also helps with a lot of our hormone production and regulation. And then bile, um, which is needed to, to help digest fats. Um, so cholesterol does play a role in our body. It's supposed to be there. You don't want you know, your cholesterol number to be zero, but you do want it to be in those more ideal ranges. And then previously the dietary guidelines for Americans was, um, it was recommended to consume less than 300 milligrams per day. And that's probably still an accurate um, number. They just released new dietary guidelines so we're still combing through those. But a big question that we get are about eggs. So you can see little eggs over there in the picture. But egg yolks do have a high amount, a high concentration of cholesterol with about 187 milligrams, but they're also low in saturated fat. Um, and then shrimp is very similar too. It's got about 189 milligrams of cholesterol with less than one gram of saturated fat. So they've actually found more recently in the research that dietary um, cholesterol is not directly affecting our cardiovascular disease risk. So most of our cholesterol that's found in our body is actually made by our liver and it's not coming from the foods that we're eating. So that's a big one there. Um, some misconceptions around eating dietary cholesterol, raising your dietary or raising your blood cholesterol levels. And they found that that's 
most likely not true because your liver is making these cholesterol. But saturated fat actually stimulates the liver to make more cholesterol. So that's why we're shooting for a more low saturated fat diet. And if you think about things that eggs are used in um, or eaten with, things like butter, if you're scrambling your eggs, you might throw butter in there, which is saturated fat, um, bacon, baked goods, hash browns, those kind of things are higher in saturated fat. So we want to be mindful of those kind of food when it comes um, to our cholesterol numbers. So it's not the cholesterol that's actually found, it's that low or the saturated fat and the trans fat that we really want to focus on. All right, so step to improve your heart health, get used to reading food labels, it's very important. Um, eating more fruits and vegetables, we already promote that for our um, oncology survivorship. Eating lean proteins, the leaner the protein, the less saturated fat that it has eating high fiber foods, drinking enough water, exercise, and decreasing alcohol intake, and stop smoking. So a lot of these guidelines, you know, everybody's always looking for a specific diet that they should follow. So there is a DASH diet, which is um, more low sodium. It's meant for hypertension um, control. And then also the Mediterranean style tends to be what these guidelines fall under if you wanted to put like a specific label on it um, as far as like a diet goes, or if you're looking for recipes, you might find some that follow those guidelines. But we use a lot of these plate methods on these presentations. This is a newer one that we haven't used before recently anyways, but this comes from Harvard. Um, this is the healthy eating plate. This falls in line with what we talk about for oncology, where you wanna have half your plate being um, fruits and vegetables or like your non-starchy vegetables, and then a healthy protein making up about a quarter of your plate, and then whole grains or starchy foods taking up the other fourth of your plate there. So two thirds of your plate is still gonna be plant-based foods, and then you've got a lean protein to help um, get your protein needs met. So choosing lean proteins like skinless chicken breast, fresh fish, lean cuts of beef tenderloin or pork tenderloin. Um, you can do beans, nuts, soy products. Those are going to be some of your leaner protein options. Your whole grains or starchy vegetables are going to be things like uh, brown rice, whole wheat, whole grain breads. Again, your beans are falling under this category too. You could do your white potatoes or sweet potatoes fall under starches on the side of the plate. Quinoa, oatmeal, whole grain cereals, corn, and peas. And then as far as your non-starchy side, that's pretty much everything else. A salad, broccoli, asparagus, Brussels sprouts, tomatoes, anything um, falling in line of a non-starchy vegetable is gonna hang out over on the left-hand side here. And then some people, you know, they don't necessarily put fruit on their plate, but you can have fruit off to the side here um, to help bring up those plant-based foods there. And then trying to focus mostly on drinking water. I know that can get a little boring. You could diffuse it with some of your different fruits and vegetables to help give it different flavors, um, but really trying to avoid or limit fruit juices, sodas, alcohol, full fat milk, um, and other full fat dairy products will be important. And then cooking your foods by baking, grilling, steaming, pan searing, and using a heart healthy oil like olive oil to accomplish that will be uh, much better options than frying stuff or um, really frying, deep frying, breaded, those kind of things. All right, so fiber is important too. Um, we talk about this a lot for our oncology survivorship, but it's found in our plant foods, so your whole grains, fruits, vegetables, beans, and legumes. And it actually helps to lower our bad cholesterol. So it helps to lower the LDL cholesterol and it improves our GI health. And then it promotes normal blood or normal bowel movements. It lowers our blood sugars and also it helps to keep you full longer, feeling full longer so you're not eating as often. And there are two types of fiber. So there's soluble fiber that kind of forms this gel-like um, concoction. And then there's insoluble fiber that really adds the bulk or the roughage and it's indigestible fiber. So that's really what keeps our bowels moving. 
And the current recommendation is to consume between 25 and 35 grams of fiber per day. Most Americans get between like 12 to 15 grams of fiber per day. So if you're more in the average range of 12 to 15, this is a great place to start um, to focus on to get up to that 25 to 35 grams. So as you increase your fiber intake, it's really important that you also increase your water intake as well because you don't want to um, increase a lot of fiber without having that fluid to help keep things moving through your GI system. Them. So this is helpful um, for a lot of different health reasons, but going back up to the soluble fiber there, this helps to prevent cholesterol absorption in our GI tract, and it slows the metabolism of sugars down. Um, so it also helps to bulk up our stool, and soluble um, fiber is found in stuff like psyllium seeds, chia seeds, the apples that have their skin on them, artichokes, barley, um, and oats tend to be more soluble fibers. And then our insoluble fibers, these are found on the skin of fruits and vegetables, um, the hard outer shells of whole grain products, and then our beans. Um, so this actually helps to feed our healthy gut bacteria. Um, so some people are familiar with the terms prebiotic and probiotic. Um, so these fibers tend to be prebiotic foods. Um, and prebiotic is the food that helps to feed probiotics that are growing in our gut. So enough about fiber. We'll move on to unsaturated fat here. So unsaturated fats are what we'd call good fats. Um, if you were using good and bad labels, but they help to reduce bad cholesterol or our LDLs in the body and increase our good cholesterol. So they help to increase our HDL and decrease our LDL. And polyunsaturated fats make up um, a good chunk of these. So those are our omega-3 fatty acids and also our omega-6 fatty acids. So omega-3s, those are found in our fatty fish like salmon, tuna, our flax seeds and walnuts are also great sources of omega-3s. And then omega-6s, these are more found in sunflower seeds, sunflower oil, and soybean oil. And then you've also got monounsaturated fats, which are going to be your olive oil, canola oil, peanut oil, avocado, nuts and nut butters, and then olives. So these are ones that you can incorporate to have those healthier fats and that you're going to see a change in your cholesterol levels if you regularly incorporate those. So our omega-3s, these are considered our best fats, and they help to reduce inflammation, blood clotting, and blood pressure. And then they're found both in plants and animal foods. And the three main types of omega-3 fatty acids are EPA, EHA, and ALA. And examples, again, where you're going to find these are going to be in your fatty fish, like your salmon, albacore tuna, sardines, um, walnuts, and flaxseed. Normally, the recommendation is to incorporate some kind of fish um, or seafood into your weekly meal plan about twice a week. Um, so these are some good options for you to help get those good omega-3 fatty acids. And then physical activity, we talk about this a lot too. It's going to be very important for your heart health as well. So aiming to get 150 minutes of moderate intensity um, physical activity per week. So that breaks down to about 30 minutes, five days per week. And that could be walking, jogging, biking, playing tennis, something that helps to elevate your heart rate. You can start out small. It's all going to count. So if you have to space it, throughout the day to get to it, that's perfectly fine. If you can do 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at lunchtime, 10 minutes in the evening, um, that's gonna add up to your 30 minutes there, which will be great. Adding walking or standing breaks if um, you're sitting down for a long time. So I have a watch that tells me to get up every hour and walk at least 250 steps. Um, so if you need a little bit of a reminder, that's very helpful. And then this one's kind of hard right now, but limiting screen time to less than two hours per day. So that's any kind of screen time of staring at a computer like we're doing right now. If you can't do that because of work, that's totally understandable, but trying to um, decrease that amount once you're home where you're able to actually get in some of those physical activities. So um, I know if I go home and just sit right on the couch, I'm probably not getting up for the rest of the night. So 
you want to try to get the physical activity in before you do that. But physical activity is super helpful because it helps us to avoid weight gain. Um, regular activity helps to keep our hormone levels in check and having higher levels of some hormones can actually increase our cancer risk, but also our um, risk for heart disease. So um, just a reminder, make sure you talk to your doctor uh, before starting any kind of exercise program to make sure that physical activity is going to be safe for you. And the American Institute for Cancer Research has some other ideas um, on good physical activity, things that you can do if you're bored with whatever you're currently doing, um, just to help space some things up. But really, anytime you can get out and be active, the more you move, the better you're going to be. And then smoking cessation is super important, so quit smoking. Northside has a great smoking cessation program. Um, smoking puts you at a higher risk for heart disease and stroke. So if you're still smoking or using tobacco products, um, now is a great time to make a goal to quit. Um, you can talk to your doctor about these programs. You can also call the Northside um, Smoking Cessation Program to get more information, or you can even email them, and they do great work, um, super helpful, great support to help get you um, to reach your goals here. It is close to a new year, uh, February. We're not too far away, so if you have goals, ask for help. And that's all I have for today about our heart health. So any questions? Didn't see any. Thank you, Kristen. We did get a few come in okay. through the chat box and I do invite anybody to still enter some if you have any questions. Um, one question that a participant asked, does a low fat or reduced fat food generally mean that it might be high in sugar? than one that is not reduced or low fat. Could. That's why you definitely want to check the food label because if they're taking something out like the fat content, then they may be adding other things in to make sure that it keeps the same flavor or that it's still going to taste good. So you might see, you know, that you have like a full fat version of something versus a lower fat version of something. But then if you're looking at say the sodium levels, you wanna make sure that they're comparable um, and that the lower fat option is not higher in sodium, but also the added sugars, like you mentioned, they could be adding some of those fillers in just to help boost up the flavor. So definitely checking the food labels there and um, comparing every company is a little bit different with what formulas they use and stuff. Okay. Um, and then one question, I think this was regarding kind of the trans fat. Is there a preference between margarine versus butter? Are there any pros to using margarine versus butter? Excellent question. Um, I feel like I had this in my previous presentation and I think I actually have an article here from Harvard that I can look at. Um, I think it goes more towards taste preference, but also, um, some of the margarines obviously have trans fat. So if you're looking at it from a trans fat perspective, then you want to try to stay away from margarines, but they've been a, margarines have come a long way um, in the recent years. And they have some that are more plant-based margarines. So they're not necessarily butter, but they're also not hydrogenated. Um, so if you're going to be looking for a margarine, trying to look on the food label to see one, is there any trans fat listed, but then also checking the um, ingredient list to see if there's any hydrogenated oils in there to see how it's made. Um, there are other products out there now that use like a liquid oil. So um, I'm not 100% sure on all of the different ways that these companies are making some of this stuff, but let me, I can answer that a little bit better, I think after I review this article, if you don't mind me answering that later. Sure, and it sounds like, again, kind of just getting really comfortable with figuring out how to read a food label and looking at the ingredients and knowing what to look for. Yes, definitely. We got a couple of questions about the plate slide, mm -hmm. how to, you know, fill, uh, whoops, how to balance each meal. Are there any, when looking to kind of fill up the fruit side, are there, and is there any concern in having fruits that may be higher in like natural sugars? I'm guessing like bananas or something like that. Um, 
No, everything really is going to fit into, you know, uh, your overall diet for the week. And so if you're thinking about, you know, when I think about fruits, I think about breakfast for some reason, adding fruits to breakfast um, meals. But no, I, any plant-based food is going to be a great option. So I know bananas got a bad rap. It's really about watching your portion sizes. So usually a medium-sized banana is a half of the banana is a serving. So if you eat the whole banana, that's going to be two servings of fruit. And what we typically shoot for is two to three servings of fruit per day. If you don't like vegetables and you don't eat them, but you love fruit, and that's the only plant-based foods that you're getting that have the fiber and those phytonutrients, then you are obviously going to eat more fruits than somebody who loves vegetables um, and really focuses their diet more heavily on, on, on vegetables. So um, it's always a balance, but I would not avoid any specific fruits just um, because of their naturally occurring sugar content. It's really those added sugars that have gotten us um, kind of in the pitfall that we're in here. Okay. I think that kind of relates to this other question someone asked. Um, when looking for fruits, are there any that are more higher in nutritional value, like maybe berries versus something that's lower in a nutritional value? Um, yeah, so every fruit and vegetable is going to have a different nutrient profile of what it's got in it and what it doesn't. So there's not any good or bad options necessarily. It depends on what your personal goals are. You know, berries tend to have more fiber in them than some of the other fruits do, but some people can't have a whole lot of fiber. Um, sometimes people just don't like berries or they can't afford berries. I mean, they're not for um, cheap by any means. So the overall goal, I think, for an individual is to look for things that are in season because things that are in season are going to be at the, the peak of their um, nutrient profiles. So I like to use the example of a tomato. So in the summer, you've got those red luscious tomatoes. You cut into it, it's red, it's super red, very bright, vibrant. Um, that has all, all those colors come from the phytonutrients that are in that fruit or vegetable. And then if you think about a winter time, tomato, they tend to be more pale on the inside. So obviously it's still good. It's still got good nutrition options going on inside, um, but it's not as fresh as maybe what you would get in the summertime. So it does lose a little bit of its nutritional value, but I mean, not enough for me to tell you to avoid it by any means. Um, so sometimes our frozen vegetables and fruits are a great option because those are usually picked at their peak during the um, on season for those fruits and vegetables. And then they're just flash frozen. So they come to you um, kind of at their peak of, of their nutrient profile, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I do love frozen um, fruits as an option because then you don't feel pressured to eat them before they go bad. Exactly. I know some, for some that goes very quickly. Yeah, um, and some the other important, sorry, one more thing. A variety is very important, so you can't, you know, you could, but it's more important that you get a variety of different foods in for a weekly basis than just focusing on only eating very specific, like just berries and just spinach. You want to try to have as many colors and different kinds of fruits and vegetables throughout the week as you can, or throughout the month. I mean, some people live, you know, one person, two people. Um, so you have to use up what you have, and it might take you all week. But over time, you want to try to have as much variety in your diet as you can, and that gets you all those vitamins and minerals that each of those different fruits and vegetables has to offer. Okay, great. And then someone asked, I think you kind of talked about this on the cholesterol slide, eating a yolk for the egg. I feel like that's always controversial and you hear so many different stories. Should we eat be eating only the egg whites or does it not matter? Um, the current research says that it doesn't matter. So it does have a higher cholesterol profile, but it's also a lower in saturated fat. Like it had that one and a half milligrams of saturated fat. So not like a saturated fat free option, but if you're eating a couple of eggs per week, then that shouldn't really be an issue um, because the cholesterol that we're eating through our diet isn't necessarily affecting the cholesterol that's in our blood since our liver is what's making that cholesterol. 
And if you mm -hmm. remember the saturated fat is what stimulates the liver to make cholesterol. So the higher your diet is in saturated fat, the more your liver is making cholesterol. So you just wanna be cautious with those saturated fat foods. So really understanding the, the science behind it. Um, and I think someone else asked a question for tuna. Is tuna in a can a healthy option? It can be, yep. So just making sure it's packed in water um, is your best option. And I think the last question that we got in is what if your systolic uh, is high and your diastolic is lower? I would ask your doctor. I'm not 100% sure on what would be affecting that or causing that to, to happen there. Okay. All right. I think that's it for all the questions. Thank you so much, yes. Kristen. So we invite everyone to join us next month. It will again be uh, March 16th at noon, and you can register for that at our website. So thank you, everybody. And as always, thank you so much, Kristen. Have a great one. Thanks, you guys. Take care. Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. If you're interested in other live or recorded programs, please visit the online program tab of our website, cscatlanta.org. Or follow us on Facebook. We'll be sharing additional information on upcoming programs.